We're working with high-risk young moms. We're working with teens and young adults with cancer. And we're working with college students who are facing loneliness, uh, lack of social connection. What kind of intervention or support might they need to get to a place where they have better outcomes? This episode is proudly sponsored by Ciempo. Many of you watching have heard of Tristan Harris and the Center for Humane Technology. We've done many episodes on the perverse incentives around screen time and critically thinking about what balance truly maximizes our potential. Ciempo built a new smartphone interface and browser extensions as the new home screen for humanity. They're at a crossroads looking for a new CEO to come in or to partner with a larger organization that has the resources to bring this incredible technology to the world. They've built a high integrity foundation and are teed up for something wonderful. If interested, message the founder Andrew Dunn at andrew at cmpo.co. More info is in the bio. Thanks everyone and enjoy the episode. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are at the Transformative Technology Conference for our second partnership with them. We are now going to be talking about Hope Lab. We have Margaret Laws joining us on the show. Hi, Margaret. Hi, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So pumped to have you on the show. Pumped to talk about Hope Lab. Before we get there, we love asking all our guests these questions. Are we really all one? Are we really? All, well, wow, that's a pretty deep way to start. Um, I think we are. I think we are. I think you've got your co- you've got the co- the kind of cosmic um, shirt on that's cueing me to find my place in the universe. But I think um, I think so. And I think you know, look, a lot of what we do at Hope Lab, and I think a lot of what brings people to a conference like this is whether at whatever literal metaphorical. Uh, sort of um, way we take that statement, we're one at least to the extent that we're really working for one another and trying to help one another and trying to, you know, do the kind of work we do, which is to be one with one another to help each other have the best possible flourishing life we can. Yes. I want to hear about your experiences with feelings of the one or feelings of interconnectedness. So are we, are we like here to talk about psychedelic journeys? Or are we? <laughs> you can take that wherever you want, Margaret. No, you know, I. So I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it to. I'll keep it to the the Hope Lab and the Hope theme today. And I think, um, you know, you asked me this question, and when I reflect upon what brings me here, and what takes me to Hope Lab every day, and what sort of drives me throughout my life, it is a feeling. Um, of that interconnectedness and of how important it is for me personally to be doing work and sharing myself and hopefully often my gifts with others. And, um, and I think that, that, you know, my, I often say to people that my work and my life are, are not distinct things that, that a lot of the incredible richness that I have in my life through the relationships that I have, through the people that I meet, through the people I get to connect with, through the work that I do, are, you know, keep those things fused in a way that um, it is just, I feel incredibly lucky and grateful. And I feel grateful to be able to do the work I do every day, but also to be among a community, this community here, but the broader community of people that I work with in health and well-being, that I think really does live that and live that idea that that we're connected we're one and we're trying to make the world a better place and trying to create opportunities for others to have a better um again more thriving flourishing life yeah let's dive in so what is hope lab doing especially in solving this big issue with mental health and well-being yeah well so hope lab um is now uh Gosh, we were founded um, 2000, 2001 by Pam Omidyar. Um, Pam, wife of eBay founder Pierre Omidyar, really wanted to help young people with cancer um, have both a better experience and better outcomes. And so Hope Lab was founded um, to try to use technology, to try to use science, research, and technology to improve health and life outcomes for young people. And what we do now is uh, we've broadened that out. We, we still do some work with young people with cancer, but our, our mission is to use tech to help uh, teens and young adults have happier, healthier lives. Yep. And uh, we're really, really still rooted in science and research. Um, we have a staff of 
researchers, designers, and kind of tech product managers. And we try to bring together some unusual partnerships, including a deep, deep engagement with young people as designers, creators, um, ideators, to try to um, understand opportunities to and then execute on opportunities to improve health and well-being. Okay, so walk us down this path of how to actually figure out what do what young, does that mean? Yeah, yeah, what do young people and adults need to live healthier, happier lives, and how do you leverage science, technology, research to figure out what? How do you deliver these interventions that help people live healthier, happier okay. lives? Yeah, so we're you know we're working right now in a few big areas, and I'll start with those. It doesn't exactly answer your question, but I'll come back around to it. We're working with high risk young moms. We're working with teens and young adults with cancer, and we're working with college students who are facing loneliness, uh, lack of social connection. So we're trying to think about places in society where we have created situations um, where young people don't have great health and life outcomes. So we've got a lot of young parents who, if they don't get um, support and, and help, uh, aren't going to have great outcomes either for themselves or for their or for their kids. Um, young people recovering from cancer, going through cancer treatment, have statistically much poorer outcomes um, for uh, social and emotional outcomes for the couple of years after treatment than their peers. And then finally, you know, we've got uh, this epidemic of loneliness, social isolation, anxiety, depression, suicide among college students, young people in that age group. And so in each of those situations, we're trying to, to take a, you know, a deep human-centered design approach. So to really work with young moms, kids in college, young people recovering from cancer treatment, to understand where are they now and what kind of support um, do they need, what kind of intervention or support might they need to get to a place where they have better outcomes, and how do they see that? So how do they see the path or the opportunities from to get from you know where things are not so great to where they can have much better outcomes? Um, and we leverage the power of research and science to do that. So we have a team of researchers, and that team um, will go deep into the literature and what's known in the science about things like social connection, um, loneliness, uh, positive psychology, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, all the things that, that we've been working with that can, in an evidence-based way, show improvements. And then bring those together with that design work we've done with young people, where we've deeply understood how they live their lives, what they care about, what motivates them, what brings them joy, um, what their challenges are. Um, and through that iterative process, the team will work on interventions. Um, and building an intervention that in some way, most of the time, at least so far, always involves a tech element. And often, uh, there's probably a couple reasons for the tech piece of it. One is because that's where young people are. They're engaging with technology in their day-to-day -day lives. And second, because we want to try to build things that can scale broadly um, and be affordable. And one of the ways to do that is by leveraging the technology that young people are using every day. Um, I have so many questions. Yeah. For you. So anyway, I'll, I'll okay, stop let's, babbling let's and let break, you ask some concrete questions. Let's break, break it down. Yeah. Let's begin this process. So then we have an example like at-risk moms, yeah. and we have this body of literature that has all these different ways to come in and make interventions around mental health and well-being. So then you have to do a process of figuring out the current. You have to figure out if how how is that person an actual at-risk mom? You figure that out. Is yeah. there like some database that you can yeah. pull at-risk moms yeah. from? And then the next thing is how do you decide? on what kind of intervention, you know, for someone that is like an at-risk mom versus someone that's a child that has cancer versus someone that is uh, just someone that's struggling in college with the mental health, anxiety issues, et cetera, depression. So this, there's a whole suite of like literature that has to be uh, parsed for the right sort of interventions for the right sort of person. I mean, this is very complicated. So yeah. let's well, let get me try. Yeah, let me try a couple ways we break it down that I think will help help you understand it and others understand it. So one uh, concept we use is we, we talk about reverse engineering health. So we think about a health outcome we want, and then we think about the behaviors that contribute to that health outcome. So what are the behaviors that are going to be make somebody more likely or less likely to have a positive health outcome? To be less lonely, to be more connected, to be less anxious, to have a, a better um, uh, trajectory with their baby. And then we look at the psychology that that acts on those things. And then we think about how technology can 
impact that psychology. Okay, so let's have this example of yeah. the the mother and her child have some sort of an at, at risk uh, situation, situation, yeah. and then the intervention. So, like, how how are, do you know that there's an at risk situation happening? Yeah. yeah, and then how do you calculate the proper intervention? Yeah. Well, that brings in partnerships. So, in that case, the the at risk moms, the young moms we're working with, are all engaged in a program with an organization called Nurse Family Partnership. So they're all engaged in this program, and they've been chosen for that because they are low income and high risk, and they've generally grown up in poverty, and they have delivered a baby early in their life, so that they're, or they're pregnant early in their life. This is the template. So that's the template, so where okay. we're starting. And then we're looking at this question of what are the things that, uh, that we can understand from the science and from the experience of the program that are most likely to lead that mom to have a positive outcome. And in this case, one of the things that we learn, and it's kind of simple, but it's probably related to a lot of what we're talking about here today, is learning to set, work towards, and achieve goals. That's something that you know you and I might yeah, take for granted, totally, but totally. a lot of the a lot of the technologies that we're seeing out there for all sorts of people really are are helping us to try to do that, to try to have healthy behaviors by learning to set work towards and achieve goals. So the aha for us in this program was that if we could build a really engaging technology intervention tool, in this case it looks like it takes the form of an app, that could help those young moms do that in places in their life that were really important to them, that that would result in them having better outcomes in all kinds of ways. It helped them totally. be more likely to get an education, be more likely not to uh, yes, harm or yes, risk yes. their child, be more likely to read to the kid, all the things that you want to see happening. Okay, and then so then there's a targeted intervention that happens to do one of these goal-oriented behaviors that maximizes their life outcome and the life outcome of their kid. Okay. So then you send how then many we, of yeah, these then, a so then week we build, or yeah, like, so then what we do is we, we build that and test it. So um, we work with partners. We actually brought a tech partner called Ayogo in uh, that has a really interesting platform. They're gamers and behavioral scientists. So they've got this behavior change platform. They can build white label products. And we worked with them to design and build this platform. It's called Goal Mama in this case. I love that name. It's funny. It's a good name. It's a great so name. So Goal Mama. Yeah, goal we decided Papa, it needed to have. Yeah, we're thinking about Goal Papa, actually. I love this. So, um, so then we build this, and then we have to test it. So we have to actually understand a couple things about it. Um, we have to understand whether the young moms to whom it's targeted or for whom we've built it like using it. Is it exciting? Is it engaging? Is it something that they want to use? And then we need to understand ba basically whether it's working to get the results that we're trying to get. Does it keep them in the program? Does it get them more likely to do the things that we want to see them do, like finish school, like read to their kids, like... Um, uh, have healthy nutrition and stay off of drugs. All those things that that we're trying to to accomplish. To, to is it like self-reported that they're achieving these goals, or like how do you know that they're achieving? Yeah, them? I mean, in this particular program, and this one's not this. Each one of these programs that if we're going to describe a couple of them, it is a little different. We and, will, yeah. yeah. And some of it depends on who the partner is. So in this case. This, this was a partner that had a program in place. And what was interesting about the program was, even though it was targeted at teen and young moms, it was did not use digital at all. And so 40 years ago, that wasn't a big deal when this program started. There wasn't any digital, nobody was carrying around a phone. But fast forward 40 years to today, you have a program that's targeting teens and, and women in their 20s, and if you don't deliver it to them digitally, it's gonna be very hard to keep them engaged. And so in this case, we were really looking at how do we actually meet the needs of today's young moms yeah. and do that in a way that's gonna be really resonant with them. So we spent, a, our team spent a lot of time out with young moms in the field. So we went out into their homes, we shadowed them, we talked to them. Then when we, we engaged them in the design and then tested with them. So a big, big important piece of what we're able to do, you know, I, I call Hope Lab, we call Hope Lab a social innovation lab. What we're able to do is run this lab where we can take a principle like, you should really have your target users, in this case, young moms, deeply engaged in designing and developing the product, we can do that. We have the luxury in some ways. You know, we're not we're not out trying to, you know, hit quarterly earnings. We've got a little bit yeah. of flexibility in how we can work. And so a big, big piece of how we use that benefit and how we use that flexibility is to engage young people at every step of the way, designing, developing, testing, the stuff that we work on. 
Okay, let's give an, this is just, I really want to try and synthesize this into some sort of like a concrete understanding of exactly what's happening with the moms that are at risk. I'm going to yeah, do my sure. best and you tell me if this makes sense and we can move on to the other ones. Okay, so a mom is at risk, maybe having a child a little bit too early. Maybe she's a young mother, etc. cetera. Um, let's say 18 year old and has doesn't a have a lot of social support in her life. Doesn't have a lot of social support. Well, yeah, these are, this is huge. Absolutely huge. huge. This is this is life trajectory changing uh, in interventions. Mm -hmm. That's why this is extremely important. Okay, then there's a bunch of literature around ways to cast these interventions into people's lives, depending on who this person is exactly. Mm -hmm. That intervention comes in and it comes in in a specialized way for different, again, these different cases that mm -hmm. you were listing that we'll get to in a little bit. In this case, it may be something that is some sort of a digital notification mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. to dive deeper into like a reading with their child or take their child to an, a, some sort of an educational place or mm -hmm. to get these goals around like what do you want to achieve in the next year mm -hmm. or in the next three years mm -hmm. maybe there's somebody that you go and meet with mm -hmm. but so it's these different sort of strategies around kind of like becoming their like self-actualization coach in a sense yeah. and and for not only them but literally the child that that, that they that they need um, and the social fabric that may not be conducive to them in this in this case or their their friends and family etc you there's a there's this it's again it's life trajectory changing was that okay Did that, that was great and I think that but I will add something that's really important and it's important in both to the understanding the story but also I think to what we're doing so in this particular program the person does have an in-person coach it's a nurse and the person the young mom meets yeah. with that nurse every couple of weeks and what's interesting about this is that when we set out to design this one of the principles that was really important to us and was really important to the partner in the project was that the technology wasn't meant to take the place of the person the technology was really meant to amplify the relationship between this nurse and this mom An and i think a yeah. lot of the things that we're seeing develop in the space of coaching and connection um, we care a lot about the human touch and the human element and one of the things for me just in, in my career and in my career with digital health and digital interventions over the past couple of decades has been to really think about how do we do a better job of combining the human touch with the, the power of technology and digital. And so one of the most interesting things about this program is that what, that in this project that we've worked on, is that what it's really trying to do is to say, how do we have the human, how do we, how do we use this human to do the things that humans are really great at, and how do we bring technology in to really amplify that? And so in this case, we've got these uh, young moms who are meeting with these nurses, and now this technology tool helps everybody connect more, connect in between yes, visits, yes. be more efficient, track what's getting done, yes, set yes. goals. Yes, so yes. that's, I think, a, an important nugget Huge of this. key. Yeah. I love that. This is, um, like, like we just, like you just described, the human still being in the loop um, for a you know, deep emotional psyche-to-psyche -psyche interaction is so yeah. crucial, um, especially if it's happening weekly, yeah. um, these types of um Let's move to we'll the next one to because one. well yeah. because these are very important. Like I was just saying, like these are life trajectory changing uh, interventions, and that's what I love about them. You know, you just view it like someone's life trajectory going, like trying to get to as much of their like peak thing that they're blueprinted for gifting into the world and sometimes people are just going like this until they die instead of going up in yeah. the least amount of time and you guys can in a sense intervene and help people get up i am we're all about this on yeah. at the show yeah yeah so we have this next one which is so it's young people that have been diagnosed with, with cancer. cancer yeah okay. so um the intervention that we developed the the product is called vivabot so um what we were trying to do was we were looking at this problem and the problem was poor social function, lots of anxiety and depression as kids are coming out of, young people are coming out of cancer treatment, kid, teens and young adults. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. It's a big identity formation time in life. And so you were a football yeah. player and then you became, you know, then instead of whatever that identity had been, you're now a cancer patient. How do you get out of that? How do you get back to a new normal yeah. identity? So that was a big piece of it. There's a big piece of it around, it's just tough. You've been out of school, you've lost connection with your peers. So there's lots of reasons that explain it. 
And so what we wanted to try to do was to, to we, we knew that. We knew that, that w there was documented scientific evidence that anxiety and depression were higher, that social function was poorer for these young people. And so we really wanted to see if we could do something about that. And so we got, uh, again, got together a lot of young people with cancer, going through cancer treatment. And we spent time with them developing a, a, you know, about a dozen concepts initially. And we ultimately converged on one concept, which was um, a way to uh, deliver a positive psychology intervention, because our science team had determined, boy, a lot of the things that young people are experiencing during this time, if we could teach them the principles and the skills of positive psychology, gratitude, mindfulness, we could help them have, have less anxiety and, and better outcomes. And then the other part that was really interesting about it was the form factor. And so we've ended up developing a bot, it's a chat bot called Vivabot. And the, uh, you know, it could have been in-person groups that met together. That was what we thought it might be initially. It could have been an app, but it could have been, you know, some way of connecting them with someone who'd gone through something similar to what they'd done. And the insight that we got from the young people was a really interesting one. And it was, you know, right now, uh, the people in my life, I, I, you know, I'm so thankful for the support that I have in my life, but when I'm not feeling so great or, or when I need to vent, I can't go to them. They either, people either feel sorry for me or they don't want me to feel bad. And I just don't feel like I can be, I, I don't feel like I have a non-judgmental place yeah, I can yeah, go. Yeah, so if yeah. this, if this thing could be kind of like a person, but not a person, not another person, that would be great. And that insight led to the concept of making this bot which is a person like you know it has a chat with you it's a chat bot so we're juxtaposing this with what we were just talking exactly, about exactly which is interesting, interesting. Yeah. and actually hearing that 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 big insight from the young people was a really important one which is i need something that i that can be non-judgmental and that i can interact with and i can at three in the morning if i'm feeling low i can go out there and there will be somebody to talk to that won't judge me and so um Vivabot was built, um, and it, it, the, the two big things that come out through the bot are uh, a chat, which introduces and teaches positive psychology skills, and then videos. And the videos are of other young people talking about the experiences that they've had going through cancer. So they're really wonderful, you know, first person young people talking about this is what happened when I had to think about, um, you know, fertility, or this is what happened when I, you know, when people, you know, kept telling me you should feel grateful because you're better, you know, you're not, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the bot and the intervention juxtapose those two things and deliver them for the young people, and they have access to it 24/7. And the exciting thing about Vivabot is, just last week, we actually released in the Journal of Medical Internet Research a study showing that it uh, significantly reduced symptoms of anxiety in young people with cancer. So one of the important things for us at Hope Lab, thank you. Yeah. One of the important things for us at Hope Lab is that we do the scientific validation and testing of the work we do. So. Um, that was published last week. We were really excited and proud about that. And we have now moved Vivabot to a formal home outside the lab. Think of Vivabot was in the lab. Now Vivabot, want, we want Vivabot living out in the world. And we've partnered with an organization called GRIT, G-R-Y-T. Cool. Um, and they're the biggest online community, social community for young people with cancer and their families and loved wow. ones. And so Vivabot is now available for free for young people with cancer and those who love them and support them. And um, and people can go out and give it a try. Um, and please refer anybody who you know who might benefit from yeah, it. Yeah, so, yeah. So uh, that one's yeah. been really ex an exciting wow, one. Wow, wow, yeah. See, I, I love this. I love the second one being so much uh, different at Hope Lab than the first one that like at risk moms are so much different um, than children uh, or young adults that have cancer um, that are going through cancer treatment um, and that are um, 
in such a part like when you talked about their identity becoming that that like really resonates because it's such a formative part of your life and like if you can't get out of that um foreign parts like if you go to jail when you're young or if you but like cancer is another thing but like have a baby have a baby like that risk (laughs) yeah Yeah. there's all yeah these are the the, the, that's a very interesting in very interesting way of putting it that there's all these different types of things that can happen um that are stimuli on your life that are are in many ways hard to see as some sort of like a a treasure like a right. trauma being a treasure right. but once you do get through that process of seeing the the god in it the source in it the unity in it the love in it the the awakening the further evolution of consciousness in it then it it's so hard to see that because here we are being healthy 27 you know right. year, years old and um trying to compare that to having a child too early or having yeah. cancer so early um but it is in a source it is in a sense source creatively expressing itself and finding these beautiful adventures of consciousness it's so hard to view it that way yeah. though yeah. and well and it's one of yeah. the things we talk about though at a at a principal higher level is you know we're trying to help think about this period of adolescence and young adulthood um, instead of as one of, of risk, negative risk, as one of great opportunity. And so there's a piece of the, when you talk about identity formation, there's a piece of all the work we do when we work with this age group, which is all our work now is focusing on teens and young adults, that really is about that, right? It's about yeah. identity formation and about opportunity yes. and about this sort of, this notion that there's lots of risks um, that happen around that time of life. How can we actually help take that that propensity for risk taking or for risk that that goes along with that phase of life and try to sort of turn it to the positive? Yeah. And so this notion of the opportunity for flourishing versus the risks of terrible things happening is really something important that drives us. So you I really hit that. on it. I love that. Yeah. Seeing it as opportunity for flourishing, catalyzing that opportunity for flourishing uh, rather than trauma that can send us down a depression spiral, all these different, this is such a profound way of viewing it. Okay. And this was another very interesting just way of explaining like this is a completely different class of intervention that is in a sense like a somewhat of a, of a, of a bot that's accessible anytime for someone to be able to, to talk to. Um, And, and actually this also reminds us of, of just the recent episode we did with um, with inner allies, and that could be something that um, Hope Lab could potentially explore partnering with as well. Um, these interventions, the array of um, of mental, emotional um, health interventions that come in for maximizing well being at these critical pivotal times is it's exploding. That's why we're here at, at Trans Tech. Yeah. Um, there's a, still a third one that we're going to explore here, and yeah. this one is blowing up in our world. Um, it has a lot to do with these with these yep. devices. Um, it has a lot to do with um, the attention economy and the business plans behind them. Uh, it has a lot to do with um, the way that uh, we are. Um, just it feels like we're our our biology has not caught up with cultural evolution, and here we are stuck in the exponential technology age with primordial brains. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have all these college kids that are like looking at people saying like they have 10 million subscribers and Mm -hmm. I have nothing. Um, and then we kind of like forget that we're all all unique colors on the color wheel, uniquely blueprinted for different things. And that it's not about the comparison. It's about the inner adventure and happiness. And so what the hell do we do (laughs) about depression and anxiety anxiety with young people yeah Yeah, let me i'll talk a little bit about about this this project we're doing in this intervention that we've created because i think it 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 won't answer that question but it gets to a lot of interesting points and in in some ways it raises like everything we do it raises as many questions as it answers so we were trying to we decided we really wanted to enter the space of teen young adult mental well-being and we wanted to characterize it as broader than health or or sort of mental illness but mental focusing on mental well-being. And so we looked at this question of what contributes to the current state of teen young adult mental well-being or lack thereof in the US. And we did this thing called a systems map, which is a very interesting process. And, And without going into that in detail, a number of places on that map emerged loneliness and lack of social connection. 
Um, it emerged in the area you talked about, which is this area of social media. It emerged in communities and people yeah. having less connection to community. And so we decided we wanted to kind of go down that path and see whether there was something that we might be able to do that could look at so we, the way we look at this is we think of loneliness and we or we don't think of it the what science shows that loneliness is a precursor to and predictor of depression anxiety and even suicide and so it's upstream as we would say in in the healthcare world but it's really important because if you could intervene at that point then maybe you could stop some of the depression and anxiety that we're seeing escalate in society. That's actually your key essence of Hope Lab is yep. ev everything upstream, upstream as yep. far upstream as possible, exactly. interventions for maximizing yep. well-being. I love yep. that. So so what we did was we thought about, okay, you know, we, we went out, did a lot of interviews and a lot of discussions with, with kids, and we ended up focusing on college um, just because of it as an inflection point. So we talk about this is a time of change, and, and also because there's been this huge, huge, as you've read about in the news, this huge challenge in college campuses. So one statistic is, you know, there's been five times the increase in demand on college counseling centers as there has been increase in college attendance. So five, you know, five times. times. And so the colleges can't keep up with that. And, and it does raise this question of, gosh, what is causing this huge demand for services in these college counseling and mental health centers? And so we began to look at this this kind of health outcome, behavior, psychology, technology map that I talked about a little bit before, and we ended up deciding that we would try to create an intervention that was targeting loneliness or the opposite of loneliness, social connection. Mm -hmm. um, again, after spending a lot of time talking with young people, understanding how they characterize and talk about loneliness, hearing them talk about things like, you know, no one ever taught me how to make a friend. You know, it's just, really interesting things that I think are things that we we have changes that we've seen in society that I my experience online and my experience in real life don't connect um, the way I would like them to that it's hard for me I feel lonely it's hard for me to reach out and make a social connection with other people it feels too risky it feels like I'm going to be rejected and so there was a lot that came into this this whole concept of if we could help young people both learn how to make social connections, but also have the skills that they need to process rejection, to process challenges, that that might be something that could have an impact on anxiety and depression. And how do we do that? And so what we did was we uh, went back, you, you, we'll take you back to where you were earlier in our conversation. We went back to the science and we looked at, you know, what are the pathways that we think we might be able to impact between loneliness and anxiety or loneliness and depression. How might um, social connection and po learning the skills of positive social connection be a buffer to loneliness and be a antidote to loneliness, anxiety, depression? And so what we ended up doing was designing an intervention, which this one takes the form of an app, it's called Nod, and we just actually launched it uh, in a randomized controlled trial on the University of Oregon campus about a month and a half ago. So now you're gonna have all the University of Oregon kids wondering if- They're all uh, out there using it right now. Yeah. So, And basically what, what it does is it, it, it plays with this idea that I talked about earlier of uh, young people, teens and young adults, are, are, their brain is wired to take risks. And so we thought, well, what if you could actually use that and create a series of positive social risks? So what if you could create a game or an experience for young people where you give them a set of social risks to take? Um, and it can be a social risk as simple as, you know, go sit down and talk to three new people at lunch today or make eye contact with people as you walk across campus or bring a friend some bring somebody something from the dining hall you know be the friend you would want to be yeah. so social challenges which may seem simple but are things that people aren't doing or feeling like they can't do and then give them the tools to process their feelings their experiences um, and you know, do that through them having the opportunity both to reflect on them. So we give, you know, like a lot of the meditation and um, uh, sort of um, wellness apps, teach reflections, give people the opportunity to 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 do that processing, and then uh, teach the skills of self compassion, so that as they're having these experiences, if things don't go so well, they learn this skill also part of a lot of what we see out there in the world of mindfulness um, apps 
of learning self-compassion. So we package this together into an intervention and we're testing that intervention. And what we're doing is we're testing, uh, we're, we're asking the question, does it decrease loneliness? Yeah. So we're doing pre and post tests on loneliness. And then uh, does it decrease feelings of or symptoms of depression? Yeah. And we're doing that test as we roll it out. So cool. we designed that with, interestingly, another company called Grit. This one's spelled G-R-I-T. Okay. It's based in Denver. Um, Grit's a theme. It's a Grit's huge a theme. theme. It's a theme. It, it was, it was yeah. a trendy. It was a trendy thing for a while. Yeah. So um, that company, Grit, that organization has a portal on college campuses called U at College. So they were an interesting partner for us because they were already reaching out to college kids, and we worked with them and kind of in their sandbox to design this this intervention visually to make it interesting to young people uh, to get the language and the kind of um, syntax and the way that jokes, the, the pictures. So we did that design work again, tested it with lots of young people, and now the test we're going through now is is really the test of can this intervention have an impact on loneliness among these first year college students? And we'll have a little bit of information about that in the early part of the yeah. year. Yeah, it seems again, very common sense that by nudging people into the very small social emotional intelligence interactions that they will decrease feelings of disconnectedness and separation and increase feelings of interconnection um, and well-being, uh, less depression, less loneliness, etc. Like, th and it's just so interesting that again, um, you know, your essence going in this direction of the most upstream early life interventions that help catalyze people's futures. Love that about Hope Lab. At the same time, it seems like if you go even more upstream than you guys fixing symptoms is even more upstream is the root of the issue being separation. You're born into the world and it's all about separation. The United States culture, these college campuses roar with economic separation, political and social separation. It Because this is the world that we've bred, it's no longer understanding every breath of air, every sip of water, every bite of food and the interconnected mm -hmm. process of that, every word that's exchanged between people. Just look back at indigenous people and the way that they still live today and that they used to live a hundred thousand years ago and their deep animism with their environment and with each other and when you look at that and you try and bring that into metropolises and into the most upstream when the child's born into the world and the social fabric around us it will make it so that all the other symptom issues go away do you feel like the most upstream issue is our tendency towards separation and our disconnection yeah, I mean, it's so, it's so interesting to hear you play it out this way because one of the things that that has really been striking to me about this particular project has been, you know, that the statistic is basically that two thirds of college kids say they're they felt very lonely sometime in the past, you know, a month I think we ask or a couple months, and that's kind of incredible because yeah. to your point, if you think about what that says about us as a culture and and what that says even what we had one of our interns who wrote this great blog piece which you should read on our site about you know just think about what that means that means as i sit here in the as i sit here in my hall of other students at this in this class i look to my left i look to my right we all feel lonely we all feel like we don't have social connection and yet here we all are together yeah. and for some reason that that's the condition we find ourselves in. And so to me, what's interesting, and I know to our researchers, I was talking with one of the, uh, with our um, director of research operations, this notion of sort of this epidemic of loneliness is really an interesting thing to, to your point to, for us to delve deeper into. Because if, we, if we're delivering our young people to college, all feeling disconnected and lonely. Disaster. Um, yeah. what, is that, what does that mean for how we're engaging and behaving as a society? And it, it can't, Absolutely. I mean, you can't, it, I totally agree with you. We say, okay, great, now we have them, two thirds of them are lonely. Let's see if we can do something to try to help fix this now. Let's see if we can do something to get them in this teachable moment when they're just starting college that maybe will help them get to connected to some people yeah. so that they won't have that experience through college. Yep. It doesn't obviate the need to do something earlier, but it yep. it definitely and it definitely gets you thinking when it's that prevalent, what is it that the most upstream. Yeah, and what yeah. is it and what is it that we're 
that we are as a society telling young people yeah. about yeah. you know themselves or about what is the social fabric no, of existence? If, if, if really they're getting to that point and thinking, you know, I am disconnected. You know, I am or I don't, lonely. Or I don't have enough I don't to offer. I'm, yeah, yeah, I don't know what my gifts are. Yeah. No, we, and we, so, we. The social fabric helps people accelerate them finding their gifts instead. Yeah. Um, last question that we like asking our guests on okay. the show. We've done such a great job unpacking Hope Lab. At least I feel, even sh given the short time, and uh, maybe we can do more epic uh conversations into what exactly like um more hope lab as well as other um important organizations around the world like you guys are doing like all of the partners that you listed as well are so interesting yeah. um the last question is what do you think is the most beautiful thing in creation wow huh the most beautiful thing in creation um you know, this is sort of like the, this is the question that, that somebody asked the other day when we were doing an icebreaker, which is, you know, sunrise or sunset. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I think for me, just as sort of as I go through my day and, you know, my life and reflection, a friend of mine, uh, you know, says she makes sure to watch the sunset every day. And I think that, um, that for me, you know, just this, this, uh, revelation every night and every day that we've that we've sort of got a new uh a new beginning yeah. that there's a yeah. that there's a moment of uh contemplation the sunset contemplation and the moment of new beginning in sunrise i think that phenomenon i don't know if that captures me and it it grounds me in a way that i i sort of get the opportunity to to really think about um intention yeah. And sort of how do I how do I not let that go? And how do I remember that there are these opportunities every single day yeah. to have and really, you know, operate on intention? Yeah. So. Yes, yes. There's my deep thought for you yes, today. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks for prompting it in me. Oof. This has been so fun learning more about you and Hope Lab. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks Thank for you. coming on the Thanks show. Thanks for having me. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Check out the links in the bio below. It's hopelab.org. Check out that link in the bio below. Also, check out the other links in the bio below. This is very important. We got to figure this out. All these topics that we talked about on the show with what Hope Lab is doing, have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about these subjects. Check out the links in the bio below to Transformative Technology Conference and all of the incredible things that they're doing here and all the organizations that are part of this. Check out those links in the bio below. Thank you, Brady Sprunger, for co-producing the show. Greatly appreciate you, brother. Thank you very much. Also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in in general. Support them and help them grow. You can find all of our links in the bio below to simulation. Our PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency. You can design cool merch and get paid. All those links are in the bio below. Check those out. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. And we will see you soon. Peace.